Okay, welcome back to the Colonial Theater for some of you. Who is here for their very first science on screen today? Anybody? Oh, that's great, welcome. Um, well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm sure many of you have heard me say this before, I'm Emily Simmons, our development director. Um, I manage all of our giving grants and memberships here at the Colonial Theater, so thanks for your support and your patronage, because you make it possible for, for us to keep operating 119 years after we were constructed, so it's a really rare and wonderful thing to have a theater like this. Um, this is the fifth year we've hosted Science on Screen, which is a grant-funded national series made possible by the Coolidge Corner Theater Foundation with major support from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. As some of you know, Science on Screen features creative pairings of current classic cult and documentary films with lively introductions or presentations by notable figures from the world of science, technology, and medicine. And we have many of those people here in the greater Philadelphia region, so this is a great program to have. Um, <clears throat> this actually would typically be the end of a Blobfest weekend, uh, but, but this weekend it's virtual, so the theater's a little quieter than usual, so it's nice to have all of you here. Um, tonight's film, as you know, is the thriller The Autopsy of Jane Doe, which premiered at the 2016 Toronto International Film Festival. Our invited scientist is Dr. Hannah Kastenbaum. She's Associate Medical Examiner for the City of Philadelphia. After the movie, she'll provide us with an autopsy of a forensic pathologist, describing the autopsy process, how medico-legal death investigatory systems work, and how the unidentified John and Jane Doe's, like the film's silent protagonist, can be known. <clears throat> Excuse me. After Dr. Kastenbaum's pre presentation, there will be a Q&A for anyone who wants to stay. Um, I will stand, I will walk around with a mic so that you can all be heard. Um, please be sure to speak up if, if I don't get to you in time. But enjoy the show, thanks. Okay, our speaker today, Dr. Hannah Kastenbaum, is Associate Medical Examiner in the City of Philadelphia's Medical Examiner's Office, where she's worked since 2019. She previously spent seven years as both Assistant Professor of Pathology at the University of New Mexico and Medical Investigator in the New Mexico State Office of the Medical Investigator. Dr. Kastenbaum completed a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology at the University of New Mexico, attended Thomas Jefferson University School of Medicine, and completed her pathology residency at the University of Pittsburgh. She obtained her undergrad degree from the University of Rochester. Originally from Reading, PA, she's an avid reader, traveler, foodie, crocheter, and supporter of the arts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kastenbaum to the Colonial Theater stage. My name is Hannah Kastenbaum. <laughs> I'm one of the associate medical examiners in Philadelphia. Um, yeah, and I'm here to talk to you about forensic pathology, autopsies, etc. So many questions after this movie. Voila! <laughs> I am, in fact, uh, a medical doctor. <laughs> I play one on TV. <laughs> All right, I'm a forensic pathologist. What the heck does that mean? Um, means I'm a physician and I work in medical legal death investigation. Um, and we're gonna chat about exactly what a forensic pathologist is and what we do and why we do it. And um, yeah, and so we'll start with that, medical legal death investigation and its players, what's an autopsy, who gets one, et cetera. How do we identify people? Jane and John Doe's in particular. Um, what horror stories can I share with you? <laughs> Given what we've, I don't know that I can compete with what we've just seen. Um, and then we'll do some Q&A. All right. Oh, and uh, no, this should not hurt. Unless I'm just terrible at this, in which case I apologize and they'll never ask me back. <laughs> All right, so pathology is the science of the causes and effects um, of diseases. And in terms of being a physician in this field, um, it's especially the branch of medicine that deals with the laboratory examination of samples of body tissue, 
for diagnostic or forensic purposes, including autopsy or postmortem pathology. Um, the field of which can be uh, called forensic pathology, which is the practice of this field of medicine specifically um, analyzing injuries, analyzing natural death to come up with, or I'm sorry, natural disease to determine cause and manner of death in the recently dis and remotely deceased. deceased. Um, Medical legal death investigation as a broad term is the system that is responsible for conducting death investigations and certifying cause and manner of death for unnatural and unexplained deaths. This certainly includes victims of homicide, suicide, unintentional injuries, drug-related deaths, and any other sudden and unexpected deaths. So we're actually involved in investigating a lot of natural deaths also. It's not all violence and mayhem and horror movies. <laughs> okay, so thrown out a bunch of terms, so who's who? So I'm a medical examiner, so that medical examiners are physicians. Typically we are forensic pathologists or general pathologists um, we are hired or appointed, appointed by medical examiner's offices. Um, currently, oh, I skipped a factoid that is important. Medi back, backing up to medical legal death investigation. So how often does this happen? To how, how many people are involved in this process? So approximately 2.4 million people die each year in the United States. Um, it is something none of us will avoid. <laughs> it is what it is. And of those 2.4 million people, 20% of them fall under the jurisdiction of medical examiners and coroners, which amounts to approximately 450,000 investigations annually. So this brings me to the fact that it's estimated that there are um, approximately 500 to 700 full-time practicing board-certified forensic pathologists, such as myself. Um, and according to one of our prof national professional organizations, they estimate that how many forensic pathologists should there be to cover, to meet the needs of the country? What do you think? Is 500 to 7 enough? Ah, you're, <laughs> it's a leading question. More, yes. Um, <laughs> the organization estimates that the country needs about 1,500, so more than twice as many. Um, so this is a complex problem and not the whole thing we're going to talk about today, but just to give you an idea of the fact that it's a big undertaking and there aren't very many of us, for better or worse. Um, so that's about medical examiners. So how about coroners? A coroner is an elected or appointed official, um, not necessarily required to have, to be a physician or have any medical training at all. Um, but they would hire somebody such as myself. I understand several of my colleagues in Philadelphia do autopsies for Chester County. So they'd hire somebody like me to do the examinations themselves but the coroner's in charge. Um, so either person, coroner or medical examiner in a given jurisdiction, um, sorry, has jurisdiction over a county, a region, or in some cases a whole state. Um, and they're in charge of the medical legal death investigation going on in their jurisdiction, deciding who needs to be examined what that examination is going to look like, whether it's a full autopsy or just an external, meaning we only look at the outside of the body, and what ancillary studies we do. Toxicology, radiology, there's a whole spectrum. So why are we talking about this? Why do you care? The distinction between MEs and coroners isn't really that important to you as the general public, um, but death investigations themselves as a field 
um, as a service provided to you by your local government um, are very important. So we provide information to families, certainly, um, but also we serve the criminal justice and public health systems. So we're providing, in terms of criminal justice, we're providing evidence from doing the autopsy um, to convict the guilty, certainly, though I cannot do an autopsy on a person and be like, well, clearly Mike Kastenbaum did this murder. That's my daddy sitting in the back of the audience. <laughs> and as his daughter, it's my job to pick on him a little. So, so I can't look at John Doe and say, Mr. Smith did it. But I can look at John Doe and say, well, he's got 10 gunshot wounds or three stab wounds or he's died of a heart attack or whatever. Anyway, so, and that can be used in the investigation into uh, the circumstances of victims of crime, certainly. Um, but in terms of all the natural deaths, my colleagues and I are involved in investigating. All of this is important for public health. So um, it's critical for surveillance, epidemiology, and prevention programs. Um, how do we know as a community that we have a problem with a certain kind of injury or with drug use or with a particular kind of cancer or heart disease? Um, and push our health departments, et cetera, to intervene in some way if we don't have that data. I'm very low tech, as you can see. How do we keep this data? So everyone who dies needs a death certificate. It's a legal document. It is a record of that the death has occurred, period. Um, and also asks for cause of death and manner of death. And they drop these terms. Um, Tommy Tilden and his son Austin drop the terms, terms in the movie. So what do they mean? So cause of death is the disease, abnormality, injury, or poisoning that caused the death. Um, on the death certificate, and I'll show you a picture on the next slide. This is a, these are free text fields. I can write any diagnosis I want. There are some standards, but almost anything goes except for um, cardiac or respiratory arrest. So the heart and, and or lungs stopping, that is death. That is not a cause of death. It's final com common pathway. Um, what's manner of death? Manner of death is a description of the circumstances, basically. And on the standard death certificate used in the US, you have six choices. It's just a checkbox. Um, natural, accident, suicide, homicide, undetermined, or pending. Meaning, I'm still working on it. Ask me again later. It's like the magic eight ball. Outlook fuzzy. <laughs> Ask again later. Um, so where this information is documented as we're as we mentioned on a death certificate and we do this to generate statistics about national mortality trends um, and as we mentioned these are used to determine what medical condi medical conditions reserve research and development funding to set public health goals to set public safety goals and to measure the health status of our populace so here, in teeny tiny print, that was poor planning on my part, I apologize, um, is an example of a death certificate. Um, it's a bunch of demographic information, person's name, date of birth, date of death, where, where did birth occur, where did death occur, um, in addition to all the details about hmm, half to two thirds of the way down, these four lines, I'm not tall enough for this either, just above. These four lines in the middle are for cause of death. And then there are check boxes right here for manner of death. If there's an injury involved, where did all that take place? And then this is an example from a how-to book from the CDC, how to fill out death certificates. 
So my name and information for the death certificates that I personally certify goes there at the bottom. Okay, so medical legal death investigation as a whole. So how does this work in the US? So there are medical examiners and coroners. Coroner, the coroner system is a, what's the right word? Mm, originated from the British system, so it's from colonial times. The coroner or crowner was basically in charge of collecting death taxes for the royals. So the system was brought to the colonies and has trickled down into its current form. Um, in the United States, it's a patchwork of state and local systems. So, some examples. Um, in New Mexico, where I worked previously, in Maryland, not too far from here, they have statewide systems. So there is a chief coroner or medical examiner for the state who employs a bunch of people to work with them to do their uh, death investigations. Um, in, it's like, okay, great, what about here? So in Pennsylvania, they're mostly county-based offices. There are a few regional ones, I think. Um, and they're a mix of medical examiner and coroner systems. Um, so the current, though I understand outgoing, Chester County coroner is Dr. Christina Vanderpol. Uh, there's some contact information for the office if you're interested. Though her deputy chief coroner, um, Sophia Jackson, Yes, is also here. So if you have specific questions about Chester County, I will defer to Ms. Jackson, who I understand um, is also running to replace Dr. Vanderpol. Okay, so that's who's involved. Um, medical examiners and coroners, we don't operate in a vacuum. So you saw at the beginning of the movie, people in white Tyvek suits walking around the home where this terrible set of deaths had occurred and Jane Doe was discovered partially buried in the basement. So there are crime scene technicians, all kinds of forensic scientists who are employed by both law enforcement or the coroner's office themselves or other health department labs and we would be useless without them. So just to give a uh, credit where credit is due. But um, so my responsibility as the medical examiner is the autopsy, if it is necessary, um, the review of all of the information generated by law enforcement going to the scene, by an investigator from our office going to the scene, by the forensic scientists and technicians who go to the scene and collect and process evidence, reviewing medical records, et cetera, and also certainly doing the autopsy when it's necessary. So an autopsy is, as you have now seen to some extent in the movie, um, a postmortem examination to discover the cause of death and the extent of disease. Or as a verb, thank you to my uh, elementary school English teachers. To, autopsy also works as a verb. So I, I autopsied Ms. Doe. Um, consists of an external examination. So what is the person wearing? Do they have any um, distinguishing features externally? I have short purple hair, brown eyes. I appear, I don't know, you tell me how old. Um, Middle-aged adult female, purple hair, brown eyes. I have scars in X, Y, and Z places and no tattoos. My ears are pierced. So distinguishing features. Um, internal examination. The movie is, starts out well enough <laughs> in this respect. Um, so the internal examination starts with the, the Y incision, so named because that's its shape, um, and proceeds from there. And ancillary studies, as I mentioned, can include, we'll take samples of tissue, um, blood, other bodily fluids for other laboratory testing, um, and hang on to them to, depending on what we think, what other testing needs to be done. 
Okay, so we saw these incision sort of, pardon my very rudimentary drawings. These are uh, copies of diagrams we use on worksheets in the office to take notes during the exam. Um, so the incisions, the Y incision here on our left um, and the red incision in the scalp on the photo on the right, they're designed for two things. Ease of access, so how do I get to the skull to open it to remove the brain to the organs of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis to remove them, to examine them. Um, so ease of access and also reapproximation. We do, to, to a limited extent, put people back together. Um, their organs get returned to the body cavity. Um, there are a lot of cultures and religions that are very particular about people being buried more or less intact. Um, the organs don't go back in exactly the right places. I'm not that talented, I'm sorry. Um, but everything gets returned to the uh, decedent. And then, um, so the point being that, can a person have a funeral and a viewing after an autopsy? Unless the scenario of uh, the horror movie and they just burn the whole place down. <laughs> or attempt to at any rate. Yes, yes. So families are often very concerned about this, and reasonably so. They want to have a viewing of their loved one before they are cremated or interred. Um, and yes, that can ab absolutely happen. Funeral home directors are highly trained individuals who will hide all of these incisions, the incision in the scalp. Um, if you look like me with short hair or my mostly bald father in the back, um, the incision might not be covered by your hair, but it's certainly covered in a pillow, in a casket. So, because we don't, it's not my job to freak anybody out. I don't want to traumatize the family any more than they've already been by the loss of their loved one. So, yes, a person can absolutely be prepared to have a viewing and a normal funeral, however the family decides to proceed. Um, so we've talked about the Y incision, and then you saw also in the movie, okay, so we peel back the skin and the tissue, the abdominal wall, and then I get to the ribs. Well, that's nice. I'm looking for injury to the ribs, certainly, but then they're also in my way. They're between me and examining the heart and lungs. So the movie is very accurate in this respect. We use big shears, like you'd get at Home Depot, to cut through the ribs. I don't mean to be crass or grotesque, but the movie was accurate in that respect. So I diagrammed it out on our little uh, clip art skeleton over here, because <laughs> I'm not a good drawer. Um, but so like we saw in the movie, Ribs up through the front on either side, and then the chest plate can be removed. Um, we pathologists like our food analogies, because we're strange. Um, and then I have access to the organs in the chest and in the chest cavity, and certainly in the abdomen. Okay, so who gets an autopsy? Um, I can tell you that my let's best case scenario, 700 colleagues nationally are not autopsying 450,000 people who fall under our jurisdiction as medical examiners and coroners. There are not enough hours in the day to do such a thing, though plenty of people would argue that that would be best case scenario from a medical standpoint. Well, sure, the information would be better if I autopsied everyone but there's not enough of me to do it. So the decision is at the discretion of whoever is in charge in your given jurisdiction, the medical examiner, the coroner. Um, certainly, oh, there are no federal standards. The state and regional statutes that apply say these are broadly the types of case deaths that should fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner's or coroner's office and then they don't touch it from there. 
Um, so our national, one of our national professional associations name, the National Association of Medical Examiners, because we're funny, um, certainly specifies that we should investigate and autopsy all victims of homicide, any injury-related deaths, if the cause of the injury or the extent of injuries is not externally apparent, um, possible overdoses and drug-related deaths, and certainly pediatric cases. Will you get a bill from your local coroner or medical examiner's office? Should one of your family members, I do not wish this on anyone, um, fall under the jurisdiction of their office? What do you think, yes or no? No, uh-uh. No, your tax dollars are already taking care of this. Thank you. Um, this is a service provided by the government using your tax dollars. I guess I gave the answer on the slide. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the majority of natural deaths that occur, people who are dying of their natural disease, do not fall under the jurisdiction of the medical examiner or coroner's office. So what if family or the physician who's taking care of them um, wants a person to be autopsied? So hospitals also provide autopsy services. Um, to patients who are either who either die as inpatients, so they've been admitted to the hospital, some diagnoses are made, um, and then they pass away, the hospital can provide that service because many pathologists are hospital-based. This used to be a very common procedure, and um, in fact, one of the accrediting agencies that inspects hospitals required that something like 25 or 30 percent of people dying in the hospital should get an autopsy. And so hospitals were motivated to do this, so they remained accredited. That requirement went away several decades ago, so this is not super common anymore, but still absolutely available, also free of charge to the family. Insurance companies are not involved in this process. When I die, my insurance company no longer cares. I mean, that's not their job. Okay, so how are people identified? They're obviously not walking into my office and being like, hi, I'm Hannah Kastenbaum. Here's my driver's license and my insurance card. And you know, and this has my picture on it and so you can tell that it's me. Um, so most people can still be visually identified. They have identification on them in their residences collected by law enforcement. Um, we can do visual comparison. So preferably we're comparing antemortem photos. So photos of me when I was alive, my driver's license, though everyone's driver's license photo is terrible. It looks enough like me that it could be used to ID me. That's the whole point. Um, and either a photo of me taken after my, uh, photo of me taken in the morgue or post-mortem. Um, we can also ask family when um, we have sort of a candidate identity. So someone is found deceased in an apartment and we know that that apartment is owned or rented by John Smith and we're gonna try and find John Smith's family and be like, this is a photo of the deceased. Is this your relative John Smith? Um, if if people's remains are not visually identifiable because they are decomposed, charred after being a victim of a fire, or otherwise disrupted, um, a scientific method of identification is preferred. Fingerprints, certainly, though this is, not everybody has been fingerprinted. I have been fingerprinted. I have no criminal record, just in case you were wondering. But I had to be fingerprinted to get my medical license in the state of Pennsylvania. So technically, my fingerprints are on file someplace. Um, so solid method of identification is printing. Um, if we have a potential candidate identity, we can. what else can we compare from the deceased person to what we know about 
the candidate, the person we think it is, uh, when they were living. So we can compare x-rays, certainly of any kind of orthopedic hardware. I have hardware in my spine because I have scoliosis. Wee. It was, you know, it was fun to be a teenager. Um, or um, people who've had orthopedic injuries can have rods, screws from pitting their um, arms, hips, whatever, back together. Um, and or from joint replacements, these things. So joint replacements certainly have serial numbers, but those are fused in place. I cannot get one out of a deceased person. So the serial number doesn't help me at all. A person who has previously broken a femur in a car accident or something and had it pinned back together, a rod and four or five pins and screws, not every person who has broken their femur and has had it repaired in such a way has the exact same orientation of pins and screws. So if I have a deceased person and I take an x-ray of their hip, oh look, there's hardware, and then I have a candidate pers you know, person who I think this is, I can try and track down those medical records to compare. Sadly, there is no national database for that kind of thing. So you have to have an idea of who this person is to get their records. Um, not everyone's been intervened upon by an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> um, much to the sh chagrin of orthopedic surgeons, I am sure. <laughs> um, but other radiology studies can also be used to identify people. Um, your bony anatomy can be unique to you. Certainly teeth, a lot of us have had dental x-rays done just in the course of our regular dental care. Um, and those x-rays can be taken post-mortem also and compared. Um, and the image on the left here is somebody looking at cross-sections through the face and brain, so cross-sections through the head. So the sinuses behind your nose and the front of your face also have a characteristic shape. Um, not quite as good as fingerprint, but if I've had either a CT scan of my head or x-rays of my head done antemortem, the same can be done to me postmortem and compared. Okay, so some horror stories. What does, well, do people ever actually, she doesn't wake up in the movie, though they decide, they decide, of course, that she is still living. But, um... Okay, so one of the powerful internet databases, or search, not databases, search engines and I, look for some stories. Well, do people wake up? Frankly, so I have not encountered this in my personal practice, which is nine years, eight or nine years. Um, I hope to never encounter it because it's the sort of thing we joke about in the morgue. We're very, you have to have a certain sense of humor to do this job. So if such a thing were to happen, I joke that um, my response would be a lot of creative curse words <laughs> and probably loss of control of bowel and bladder. Like, it'd be a mess. <laughs> I'm just being honest. So I have not personally seen this yet, but I found a few stories. Um, thank you, Google. So in September 2007, the news service Reuters reports a dead man wakes up under the autopsy knife. And this was a man in Venezuela who's declared deceased after a highway accident and taken to the local morgue. He wakes up in excruciating pain after the examination has started. This is also my nightmare. <laughs> um, examiners only noticed something was amiss when he started bleeding. Um, at the time of this article, uh, Reuters could not reach the hospital officials to confirm, ev confirm events, but they had a photo of the guy holding up the like authorization for his autopsy. <laughs> like, that's not a photo I ever want to exist of me. <laughs> so in January of 2018, 10 years later, Cosmopolitan reports another case. What Cosmo has to do with this? I'm not entirely sure. <laughs> Um, so a 29-year-old man in Spain shocks doctors after waking up during his autopsy. He was an inmate in Spain. 
He's found deceased in his cell early one morning. He had complained of feeling unwell recently. And when he's found, he had already turned purple, and he, they couldn't locate a pulse. So they're like, well, he's dead. So they took him to the morgue. And when the forensic experts began the assessment, they heard faint noises coming from inside the bag. Oof. They opened the bag and found the inmate was still alive. He started off snoring and wheezing. Cue loss of bowel and bladder as discussed. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more. Um, in slightly more recent news, March of this year, Yahoo reports a man in India. He suffers head injuries and is taken to a hospital. Um, and the family is told, look, he's not going to survive this. You should just take him home to pass away quietly. The family doesn't like this advice and takes him to a private hospital. Upon arriving to the hospital, somehow a crowd gets involved. The medical staff can't actually examine this man. The crowd is convinced he is deceased, and they march him right to the morgue. Do I know where the morgue is in every hospital? No. <laughs> At any rate, so he's in the morgue, and um, examiners notice he's breathing. <laughs> Officials claimed bad judgment by the private hospital, and the patient was moved to a different hospital, where at the time of the story, he was recovering. So uh, the, the moral of this story is that death is not a diagnosis that I would want to crowdsource. <laughs> All right, so how about some other concepts? that came up in the movie. Um, oop, I skipped. I skipped the slide. I apologize for being slightly terrible at this. OK, so apparently the, this phenomenon, quote unquote, waking up after being pronounced deceased, um, happens enough that it has a name. Uh, Lazarus syndrome so named for the Bible story, um, or autoresuscitation, defined as the return of spontaneous circulation after termination of resuscitation following cardiac arrest. I found a um, review article published by the Scandinavian Journal of Trauma, Resuscitation, and Emergency Medicine. The authors identified 65 cases in the literature of whom 18 or 28% made a full recovery. The authors go on to suggest, well, how do we avoid this scenario? Uh, we use our eyeballs and all of the technology that the medical profession has and scientists have afforded us. Stethoscopes, sure. Electrocardiograms or EKGs. Um, Excuse me, and the like. So in particular, they suggest observation continuously and by EKG or ECG, uh, monitored for at least 10 minutes after, and I cut off my own sentence, termination of resuscitation. So like, okay, you're ready to call this person or declare them deceased. Maybe we should have somebody watch them for a little bit just to make sure. Okay, so what else comes up in the movie? How about this bell around the ankle? I have not encountered this either. Um, apparently, so I've consulted, uh, I paged Dr. Google. This is how we refer to it in the office. Um, and um, the term saved by the bell may refer to boxing, um, but it was apparently not uncommon in the Victorian era for people to be buried alive, and so there were all sorts of safety or alert mechanisms built into coffins to alert funeral home and graveyard staff. Somebody was in a box it shouldn't be, including bells and other alert systems. So 
I'm not in the funeral home industry, so I don't know if these are still common. I would hope they're not necessary, but who knows? <laughs> um, okay, let's see. So, so I have nothing to add to the bells around the ankles of deceased people. I'm sorry. Uh, the facilities shown, so they're in the, the basement of a funeral home. It's not uncommon for um, funeral homes to work in concert with the coroner or medical examiner's office, certainly in small jurisdictions. Um, I did not Google Grantham, Virginia. I'm sorry, I don't know if it actually exists or what their medical legal death investigation system is. But certainly in small or rural jurisdictions, this would not be an uncommon setup. And the room seems reasonably equipped. Um, let's see. They mention when they first start examining Jane Doe, they talk about the color of her eyes. Are they gray? Are they blue? And uh, Tommy, coroner, mentions, you don't usually see this type of clouding, and I forget exactly what time frame he mentions, but um, I consulted one of my handy textbooks, not Google in this, in this <laughs> example, um, and corneal clouding, a couple of hours shows up. So it's pretty soon. Um, how about flammable liquids? At some point, Austin dumps something on the body and tries to set her on fire. It doesn't work though the room almost goes up. I tried, so I watched this in preparation for this talk. I watched this movie last week, uh, but it was on my Kindle Fire, which is you know half the size of this piece of paper on an airplane. Uh, and I just kept pausing it and rewinding and trying to catch the label on that bottle. I couldn't catch it. I'm guessing it was formalin or formaldehyde, which is used to preserve tissues. Uh, the tissue samples we take at autopsy, that is flammable. Um, and obviously, in the funeral home, they have the facilities to cremate people. The, the little, little, it's not little. The machinery used to do this is called a retort. And that's pictured in the movie. I've not seen one in person, so I can't tell you if it's accurate. But a um, cremation requires temperatures and durations outside the range of typical structural or automobile fires. So even if they manage to burn the building down, she might still, or some of her remains might still exist in there. How that fits into her story of being possibly a witch from the 17th century, I don't know. And they don't burn the house down, or the building down. So, yeah. But it wouldn't have worked, is my point. OK, so estimating time of death. We talked, I mentioned corneal clouding, actually appears within a few hours. Um, Alger mortis, somebody, t one of my teachers in like high school, you know, I told them I was thinking about pursuing medicine, and like, you should study Latin, obviously. It's like, mm, I did not study Latin. I have, I managed <laughs> to make it through school anyway. So. I didn't look up the Latin for this, I apologize. But Alger mortis refers to the change in body temperature. It's basically, so normal body temperature in a human is 98.6 degrees or so. And after death, the mechanisms that maintain body temperature stop operating, so body temperature comes to approximate whatever environmental or room temperature is. There are some formulas for how this usually goes or sort of the timeline, so you can sort of back calculate. Um, if you take a temperature of a um, deceased person, there are formulas to back calculate. Well, how many hours have they been deceased? But there are a lot of variables in this. Am I found deceased in my unair conditioned apartment when there is a 95 degree, 90% humidity heat wave going on? like there is here and in most of the country, sadly, well, then I may stay at 90 some odd degrees for much longer than I would if I was found in a refrigerated storage unit or whatever, a very well air conditioned building or out in the cold. 
Um, so lots of variables. Live or mortis is the purple-red discoloration, um, which we can see in this picture on the left, um, from the settling of blood after the heart stops pumping. So when the heart stops pumping, the blood just sits where it is, initially in the vasculature. As the body breaks down, the blood vessels break down. So initially, the blood is still liquid, moving around in the tissues, in the blood vessels. And so liver mortis is blanchable, which means if, like in this picture, I push on the person's skin, I can squeeze the blood out of that tissue. And so you get a pale handprint there. After, <laughs> somewhere I wrote it down. I think it's liver appears within a couple of hours, maximal 18 hours to 24 hours, and then starts to fade, or then becomes fixed. So which means if I can push on the person all I want, and the, blood, the purple discoloration is not going anywhere. Okay, so also Riger mortis. This is the stiffening of the muscles. So um, deceased people, the remains of a deceased person do not move after death, but they will stay in the position that they were in when death occurred because the muscles stiffen because the molecule that provides energy to the muscles is not being created anymore. Um, so the muscles stiffen. So I did not include them, but I had a good picture. Um, a person had collapsed suddenly, you know, ended up kneeling on the floor. And when he was found sometime later and rolled over, his arms are still up in the air. So dead people don't defy gravity unless they're already in Riger. <laughs> um, so this doesn't, I think, I think one of the Tildens mentions this at some point, that she's not in Riger. The time frame for this usually starts in a couple, within hours, maximal three to 13 hours, and then starts to go away, basically as the muscle fibers themselves break down. Uh, refrigeration slows this process down. Heat accelerates this process. Um, it is also apparent in the teeny, t so it, it affects all muscles the same, though it becomes apparent in the fingers and the jaw, sort of most or earliest, um, but can also be seen in the teeny tiny muscles that connect to the hair follicles in your skin. So deceased people can have goose, goose bumps. And it's not because they're freaked out, <laughs> as far as I'm aware. <laughs> so that's rigor mortis. And it'll go away on its own, as, as I said, as the muscles break down. OK, I have probably bored you to tears, and I'm sorry. Who has questions and answers? Or I have answers, hopefully. <laughs> Sure. You were so kind as to listen to me babble for so long. The least I could do is try to answer your questions. So we do have a mic. And I've, I've learned the hard way that when we're all spread out like this, it is best to use a mic so that everyone can be heard. So if anybody has a question, raise your hand, and I'll try to get to you as quickly as possible. What drew you to the field initially? I know you said you were in high school, right, when you first started thinking about exploring this? So um, I was initially interested in medicine because coming up through school, like grade school, high school, I really liked biology. We dissected, you know, frogs and fish. Not people, good lord. They don't let high school students do that. No, 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 no. But I thought the anatomy and the physiology was all really interesting. And then um, I've made several jokes about my father, who's been very patient. But um, he is also a physician. He's an internist or general practitioner. He's retired, but had a 
long career in medicine, and um, so besides him, there were lots of doctors in my orbit as a young person, um, because not only is my father a physician, but we're Jewish, and Jewish doctors are a dime a dozen. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass anyone, I'm just making jokes at my own expense. So, um, I know I was also just really impressed by what these people knew. Well, you know, tell me what's going on, and you'd give them a little spiel, and they'd look at you or examine you or order some labs or something, and then they had a whole list of reasons why you could be the way you are. And I just thought that was insane. It's like, I want to do that. So, that's what sort of sent me on a career to medicine. And then in medical school, your first two years are basic sciences, so anatomy, physiology, on and on. And um, then you do your clinical rotations. And so the core clinical rotations are the types of things that most doctors do. Internal medicine, like my father, you take care of living people. Pediatrics, OBGYN, whatever. So these are your required rotations, and then you have some time to do other things that just interest you. And so I thought maybe pathology would be pretty interesting. It's a big chunk of the first two years because you're learning about how to diagnose diseases. And a pathologist is involved anytime you have labs drawn, your appendix removed, or a tumor removed, whatever. A pathologist is the person who makes a diagnosis. Um, and so I thought that part of medical school was super interesting. I was like, this is kind of cool. And um, it took me a while to decide going through my clinical rotations. I actually seriously considered OBGYN was my first rotation. And like, there is kind of nothing one cooler or two more pressure than delivering a baby. So, um, but I also really liked, I finally did an elective in pathology, and I really liked the microscope work and the looking at the specimens. I think I only saw one autopsy as a medical student, but it was enough, it's like, I wanna do that. And it's okay that I'm not gonna see and treat live people. I may be an awkward public speaker, but I handle people just fine. <laughs> I like people. I still have to talk to people. You know, like I have colleagues and other people I work with and people in the grocery store. You know, I'm a f more or less functioning human, though you may not think so based on this. <laughs> so, um, where was I? Um, w yeah, so everybody in medical school is applying to their residencies, which is the training like in whatever specialty you're gonna pursue. So I had chosen to pursue pathology. So the docs you're working with know that all of you are doing this at the same time, because it's just the timeline is the same for everyone. So at that time in medical school, I don't remember what rotation I was on, but everybody would ask you, oh, so you're a fourth year, okay, what are you applying to? Like, what's your residency? I said, oh, I'm gonna be a pathologist. But why? You're so good with people. Cause I like it, and it's still providing a service. So, I like it, I found it intellectually stimulating, though arguably all of medicine is. Like none of it's easy, that's not the point. But um, yeah, I like it and I feel that I'm still providing a service, even now that I am working with deceased patients. Um, so yeah, long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody else? <laughs> I'm waiting for my dad to raise his hand. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michal. Met you earlier. I also work at the Colonial. Your job seems yes. awesome. I had a Thank question. You. Sure. I, I'm sure many of us here also watch things like Criminal Minds and all those fun TV shows. Yep. And I want to hear your opinion on one of the things I find irritating is that it'll take a day or an hour, it feels like, for them to, for an autopsy to be performed and then the pathologists go through the information and then they have a cause of death and all that. I feel like that's absolutely wrong and it, it takes so much more time and I just wanted to hear what is the actual 
how long does the actual process take? Sure. And, yeah. So it, the short answer is it depends. So depends how much there is to document in the process of doing the autopsy. So if I am charged with examining a 22-year-old young person who is known to have a history of substance abuse and is found deceased with drugs or drug paraphernalia in their residence, um, so I have some thoughts already with that information as to what might be going on here. Like on one hand, 22-year-olds are not supposed to just up and drop dead. Um, but I have some information from his history and from what law enforcement and the family and the investigator from our office is telling me about the scene. So we try to autopsy as many suspected drug overdoses as possible because it may be. So toxicology studies take weeks. But I can find some evidence at autopsy that might suggest an overdose. Um, so that, but however, he's a 22-year-old man. He has no injuries to speak of um, and is unlikely to have significant natural disease because he's 22. And uh, youth is wasted on the young, <laughs> or so I am told. Anyway, um, so his autopsy could be really quick, an hour. There's not a lot for me to see. So, um, or... It's not that there's not a lot to see. There's not a lot to document. I don't need to take a thousand pictures. I don't need to take a thousand pieces of tissue to look at eventually under the microscope. Um, now in a more complicated autopsy examination, so um, victims of homicide. We won't get into the politics of it, but gunshot wounds are the type of injury we see probably most commonly in our homicide victims. And for reasons unknown to me, it's never like two gunshot wounds. It's like 10 or 15. I don't, again, I don't mean to be crass or to freak you out, but that's a lot to document. We want to take pictures of them. We take measurements to describe where on the body they are. Then I have to try to decide, well, is this an innie or an Audi? Like, I have a, what looks like a gunshot wound hole. Is that where the bullet went in or where a bullet came out? Then we use radiology to decide if there, are, to find out if there are any bullets still in the body, because they're radio opaque, so we can find them on x-ray. Then I have to try to match up the holes and or the entrance with the exit. So this takes time. So that autopsy could take six hours. And then it takes me another two hours to take my notes back to my desk. <laughs> well, and then I saw this and then and really figure it out. So um, can be a long time. So in the first example, the 22-year-old suspected of being an overdose, the autopsy itself is pretty quick. But waiting for the toxicology studies, I might not have an answer for 10 weeks because that's the way... Does it necessarily take that kind of time to do that testing? No, but those forensic scientists and laboratory scientists are just as poorly staffed and funded as I am. So it takes time for that. Also, they have other responsibilities, DWI testing and that kind of thing. So the specimens have to wait in line and then get examined and the data has to be evaluated. So the autopsy is quick, but getting all the rest of the data back is not quick. On those TV shows, I watch them all too. They're not accurate, but they're fun. Um, yes, and they're like, oh, I will draw a sample, and then I will walk it right over to the, to the machine, and I will squirt it into the machine, and in five minutes it will tell me what, which of 30,000 drugs and chemicals are in his in bloodstream. It doesn't work like that. I wish it did. So, and in the example of the homicide victim, I know, just looking at this person, I don't know why they're dead. It's not rocket science. Like, probably one of those dozen bullets hit something important. <laughs> so why am I doing that autopsy? Again, because I serve the criminal justice system. And I want to try to figure out what I can about how many times is this person shot? 
what's the trajectory? Is it going, you know, M, just to pick on you, sir, because you, I can see you with the lights in my eyes. Um, if you were to shoot me right now, so the bull, I hope this doesn't happen, but it's, it would be very aggressive for me to say, I'm going to shoot you right now. So we don't want that either. Um, but so does the bullet go front to back? Does it go back to front? Where's the entrance? Where's the exit? Where's the entrance? Where's the bullet? And then when the detectives show up and interview everyone in the audience, well, what the hell happened? Um, then they can try and match up all of your statements to what I see, or what my colleagues, since I am now on the floor, um, see at my autopsy. So cause of death, manner of death, not a question in that example. But um, the exam, so coming to that conclusion doesn't take a lot of time. But doing the exam takes a lot of time. Does that answer your question in a very long-winded fashion? So unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions in this venue. But Hannah, if you have the time. I have some time. OK. Uh, we can make our way out to the lobby and then to the garden suite, okay. which is our rental space. OK. And you, you can just follow me. Yes, I would like them like that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for being here today. We really appreciate it.